Thank you. So, uh, can you listen to me? Yes, right? Can everyone, seems like everyone can listen to me, right? Yeah. Please let me know if you have any problem. 
in the uh, in the chat room. Yeah. Uh, firstly, good evening. I'm oh, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm Chairman Lai. Yeah, from Hong Kong. I'm the I'm the chairing speaker in this section. Uh, in this section, um, the section eleven, we will introduce uh, several topics. Yeah. Uh, firstly, from Professor Zhang in Taiwan. Secondly, um, from Michael from in Canada and uh, from Alex in also in Canada. They will share some uh, meaningful topic with us. Yeah. So uh, next, uh, I would like to let you know, uh, okay, uh, there are 15 minutes per session and five minutes for Q&A. You can always leave your questions in the chat room and um, maybe I will, I will help you to ask um the presenters after the presentation after the sessions yeah there are three topics here the first one is about taiwan leisure farm that will be shared by professor Zhang, and the second one should be um, the building back with bikes as po a post covid solution which will be shared by mr michael thirdly about um the um, purpose reconnecting with nature will be shared by mr alex so um i'd like to invite uh, the first speaker, Professor Zhang, to share her topic, the Le Taiwan National Fund with us. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's okay now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I will start to talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Good. Good. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Zhang, and also the Michael and the Alex. Okay, and all the old, uh, audience, I couldn't see you anyway. Good afternoon. I hope. I hope. You guys are feeling great and then wonderful and also feel safe and healthy. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself a little bit to all of you. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Shenshen Zhang and uh, I'm currently a full time professor at the Port of Malaysia and Regulation Management, um, Minchuan University. And um, this is the logo from my department and this is the logo from my university. And uh, Minchuan is like uh, in Taiwan. Um, besides being a full time professor in university, I also um, I'm also really a um, active. Okay, and uh, uh, in another world, I actually spend lots of time doing project and the research for the government. Okay, so currently I'm one of the member of a consulting and the guidelines group of a leisure agricultural project under the Taiwan city of Taiwan. So uh, due to this kind of a task, I actually uh, need to get involved in many, many leisure farm development and I help this leisure farm to upgrade itself to um, operate the farm as an uh, agro-tourism site. So I'm actually uh, also a professional leisure farm loan planner for Daoyuan, Daoyuan and also the Guishan area um, in Taoyuan of Taiwan. So today the topic I would like to share is the Taiwan leisure farm, but I would like to share the story how we actually upgrade the leisure farm from the one leisure farm to, uh, to uh, agricultural tourism. Um, how two, three, or even four or five leisure farms, they actually work together as a uni and uh, to provide the agro-tourism tours. So this is, will be the uh, subject uh, today I would like to share, okay? I only have 15 minutes, right? So I'm going to measure the time by myself, okay? <laughs> I'm really worried I will talk to too long, okay? So let me set up my timer very quickly. Okay, I forgot to set up timer, okay? 
Okay, uh, there, there will be three subjects I would like to, to talk. The first one, I will talk a little bit about the definition regarding uh, agro tourism in Taiwan. And uh, in Taiwan, uh, our agro tourism has a different style and a type, which might not be the same as your experience, or uh, may not be the same as your country, okay? And then I will talk about uh, the trends. What we are doing regarding the Taiwan agro tourism development? We actually have four, four top, uh, top, uh, top call. The first one we actually offer the environmental education section in the agro, agro tourism. We provide the working holiday, and we shift our guest, our target market from the local, local tourist to the most, most tourist, and we also implement the quality quality assurance concept into the leisure fund operation. So those are the three subjects I would like to share with you guys if I can manage the time in the proper way. Okay. So um, this is some basic information regarding the uh, agro-tourism industry in Taiwan. You will be able to see the Taiwan is really Taiwan is not huge, okay, of course compared to the United States or China or even the Japan, we are much smaller and currently we have more than three three fifty uh, i didn't i didn't i did not update my number but uh, right now 2021 the number is more than 350 so we have actually 350 legal leisure firm uh, over in taiwan and uh, here is where i am located right now where i've been served okay which is a town yet Taiwan is not actually, um, I would say the popular, the most popular destination for agro tourism for the past 10 years. Because if you ask any Taiwanese, the best leisure fund, uh, if they think about the leisure fund, they think about the agro tourism, they might, they might tell you Yilan, Yilan or Nantou, or even the Taichung Miaoli would be the best best place to go. So the Taoyuan spent lots of effort, especially in these five years, in order to, to actually uh, convince Taiwanese, Taoyuan, we do have a very great leisure farm, okay? And um, uh, besides the leisure farm, the Council of Agriculture, they actually convinced the leisure farm shouldn't do this alone, they should actually work together as a union, as a group. So um, they suggest the leisure fund, which are located nearby, they can work as a union. We call it leisure fund loans. With the leisure fund loans, and they are able to do everything together. For example, uh, they can build our Airbnb, they can provide the house gas room, they can provide the restaurant, and then they provide the entertainment and recreation activity as a group, as a uni, not to work this alone, okay? So, uh, so far, I think how many we have? We have around uh, a thousand, which is not really a lot, but we are still, uh, this number is getting bigger and bigger. And if you look at this number in 2018, actually, if we look at the domestic uh, traveler, and uh, almost 15% that when they travel, agro tourism will be the first destination they want to go. This number shows Taiwanese are really into the agro tourism because this is the, the way they can actually appreciate the nature. And the other thing is Taiwan is a really modern society and uh, uh, full of the building and uh, full of the you know factory. So our children, our kids, they don't actually have a real experience about the agriculture. So many, many family, actually many parents like to spend their whole weekend or holiday, take those kids to, to do something at the leisure farm in order to show what is the agriculture, what is the forest, what is the ranch, what is the fish to, the, to our kids. So, um, if we we call in Taiwan, if you are going to call yourself as an agro-tourism destination, you actually need to provide the four elements. The first one is something for them to do. The second one is some place they to stay the 
lodging, dining, and also shopping. We all understand as long as you can keep the tourists as long as possible, you are earning money from them. If they only stay at your place more for like two hours, you are not actually making money from them. So the first element is um, we provide the food, but uh, currently in agriculture destination, we provide a healthy food, healthy way to eat. So we have five concepts, low mileage, local food, local ingredient, and uh, organic ingredient. And also we only use the cinnamon food and then light meal. So that is the five, the most important thing, the agro-tourism side want to make promotion to the ruler dining compared to the regular restaurant, okay? And uh, some, some leisure fund they actually promote, you actually can pick all the food ingredients by yourself. And uh, then you can actually do the cooking right here. And uh, they will teach you how to do, how to cook the organic food in the right way. Then you can eat. So the entire process, you witness, you see it. And then also you are taking classes. This is also one way you can appreciate the food in the rural area, in the agriculture tourism site. And the, for some leisure fund, they, they are even much more, I don't know, upgrade themselves to a, a, a better a, a better designation. For example, like a one leisure fund from the uh, Elad, in summer, in every summer break, they even um, have a tour. They call it a five day summer agricultural tourism camp in, in, in farm. So the kids will be able to learn how to plan the agriculture to cook, pro, to produce, to eat. They even need to spend the time to uh, traditional farm, the market, to, to learn how to sell the food. And uh, in the end, the owner even take those kids to share the food with the minority. So during the five days, the kids are educate the, the agriculture industry by different angles by different perspective and this one is really popular and is also really really interesting for the for the city city kids okay and uh, the second element is uh, the agricultural tourism i also provide the uh, accommodation but the accommodation they actually have a local atmosphere depending on which area they are located so so for example, in the S part of Taiwan, majority, majority of the Jiu Fang, they provide accommodation in the tribe, tribal style. And sometimes they provide accommodation with water base. So um, it will depend on which area they are located. And then they will try to make the accommodation uh, has their local style, their, their, their local atmosphere. Okay. And um, I'm not sure about your people, but I'm pretty sure about the Taiwanese. When Taiwanese travel, even they are they they are they travel for agri agricultural tourism. Taiwanese always love to shop to buy. They need to buy something to bring home to make sure they can remember. Oh, this is the day. What did they do? What did they did? Okay. So shopping is really important uh, element. Okay, in agro tourism. Okay. So uh, this is some demo, some things the, the, the tourists can really bring home, something really related to the agriculture atmosphere. And the recreation and the entertainment for fun, like uh, the, to experience how to do the tea planting, milking, carol harvesting, okay? And uh, to experience uh, how to live like the old style, okay? And uh, they can even experience the all fashion wedding ceremony. And uh, uh, sometimes the leisure fund provide a life spirit activity. People can actually do it together. Okay, definitely do it by yourself. It's one of the entertainment and the recreation and the agro tourism they try to do. So uh, in the end, the agro tourism uh, in Taiwan, in the center part, central part is they try to bring the happiness. By uh, by combining the um, a healthy eating and then um, 
um, local, uh, local, local atmosphere uh, accommodation, and uh, to to experience different style of the recreational leisure activity, and and they also bring something home, and through this way they can have a real happiness. And what is going on with right now we are doing, and I think I only have three minutes, two minutes left, right, man, mainly, mainly, right? <laughs> okay, I, I will go quicker. Uh, okay. I think, I think you can, you, you, um, maybe uh, three or four minutes seems that. Uh, sure, is, sure. Uh, okay, three uh, minutes. Okay, I will I just pick. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll pick something important. Okay. Um, the first one, I will just focus on this one. Okay. Um. We do have a lot going on, but something which I feel really proud of is because I am also engaged with this one is environmental education. Uh, Taiwan government actually uh, implemented the Taiwan Environmental Education Act in 2011. What does that mean? That means in Taiwan, so actually the uh, government officer, the kids, junior high, senior high, and elementary students, they must take at least four hours environmental education classes or traveling or tours. Okay, so this is awful important in Taiwan. So all of us must engage in four hours, four hours education courses. Okay, so most people will choose to spend some time outside and to have a good time and also take a four hours environmental education classes. So this is the opportunity for the leisure farm. So the uh, Taiwan government lists out there 11 style uh, facility you can develop environmental education. And of 11, one of them is leisure farm, okay? Personally, I actually have one leisure farm to develop, uh, uh, become the official legally uh, site which can offer environmental education uh, classes, okay? Currently, of the 350, only the 14, they are issued and the certificate as an official site which can offer the environmental education uh, courses. So you, you can see this is uh, what we have. So it's still the beginning and uh, still a long way to go. So uh, for example, like something uh, like uh, two, two to four hours, the kids need to learn how to transparent the, the rice plugging, plug, picking up, and cook. And then they will take the assessment learning, and in the end, they will need to go home and learn to, we actually give the kids the idea how to preserve, how to protect our earth and the environment. And we hope they can bring this concept, go home and share with their parents, with their relatives, with their friends. So my time is up, okay? So uh, this is what we do, the first one. And then we also uh, actually invite uh, the foreigner come to stay one to one month in our leisure farm to show the Taiwanese culture to the foreigners. And uh, we actually upgrade ourselves, um, ship from the local tourist to the Muslim, Muslim tourists. So, Currently, we had at least 13 uh, leisure farms, uh, officially certificate, uh, Muslim friendly leisure farm. And uh, in the end, we collect the data regarding the economic impact and the service quality of the leisure farm to ensure, ensure the agricultural site is carry certain level of service quality. So um, I'm so sorry, I'm running out of time. I have too much to offer. So I will stop right here, but I actually leave my personal email. So if you are in this industry, if you are doing the research or, or you are in this business, feel free to email me and then we can talk and chat afterwards. I'm so sorry about, I did not imagine the time in, in a good way. And uh, Manley, here you are, okay? I'm going to stop right here, okay? Thank okay, you. Thank you Thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Zhang. Um, there is a question from um, a delegate. Um, um, delegate would like to ask whether um, the five-day trip can still promote the products in, in the homestay um, pranks. Yeah, yeah. Would you please share something about uh, how the um, 
Oh, okay. The so, for the five days trip is for the kids summer camp. So it's like it's like it's the kids summer camp. Uh, here is the thing in Taiwan. Um, like my daughter is who is actually the ten. So we always arrange uh the summer camp for them. So I will. So some people like to send the kids to the uh different uh area to the agriculture site. And then the kids will learn how to plant, how to produce, how to cook, how to sell. But uh, the, the revenue is not going to the kids. It's, it's for fun. It's for entertainment. Okay. And it's quite a kind of popular and also the uh, interesting, you know. But I must say, majority of the customers, they are from the northern part of the rich family. Why? Because uh, you know the kids from the rich family, they they grow up in the modern city. They live in the building. They never see the cow. They never see the real vegetable. They never get their hands dirty. So that's the reason the parents send the kids to the farm for five days to learn how to appreciate what they have. And in the end. Um, you know, uh, sometimes they could not sell all the vegetable, right? So there are some left out, right? So the farmer even took the kids to to donate the vegetable to the homeless person, to the orphan. Yeah. So it's about the sharing. So there are a lot of concept going on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, would like to ask Professor Zhang. Yeah, may I know? Uh, there are any differences between the local tourists and the foreign tourists in the um in in, in, in the um uh, leisure farming in the leisure farming. Okay. Um, because uh, the question did not mention like uh, uh the social background difference or or they are looking for different things. Okay. Um, I. Um, I will just try to answer this question in journal, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, normally, for the foreign tourists, uh, I must say, um, we shipped the market, uh, the foreign tourist market from the uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong Pa to the uh, southeastern Asia in these five years. It's because of the government, because we have a um, not so good relationship with China. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah. we yeah. actually ship our uh, inbound tourist market from China to mm -hmm. the Southern East Park. But before that, uh, the, 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 the majority of the uh, agricultural tourism uh, foreigner uh, market are from Hong Kong and the Japan. Okay, because I don't know, maybe in Hong Kong, there's not too many leisure farms. So, yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. Yeah, we, don't, it, we don't have any leisure fund. Yes, because you don't have. So that's the reason you came here. So you will be mm -hmm. able to see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we also have the uh, foreign trade from European area. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the scale of the leisure farm in Taiwan is totally from the European and American style. American and European style is huge and it's big. Taiwan is a tiny and a small and a very delicate. Okay, so so uh, in the old days, that's our major tourist. So, but I would like to say the uh, the most popular leisure farm. I mean, uh, from the perspective of the uh, foreign tourists, is tea, tea, Chinese tea, Chinese. and the oh, tea and also the flower. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. flower. Because yeah, that's, that, that's the two things that Taiwan is the most powerful in terms of agriculture pro production. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. then for the Taiwan uh, local tourists, it, it's really simple. It's like uh, the, uh, the people go there to have a one, good, one day good time. And uh, we like to get our hands dirty. It, it's just the experience, to, to experience the dirt. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, I hope I actually answer the question from the, I don't know, the audience. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, yeah, may, may I invite uh, Michael to, to have a second presentation? Yeah, but I still leave my email on the chat room. So if you if people have more questions, they can just submit an email, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay.
I, I, I will send you an email. Yeah, yeah, we'll sure. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. May I invite Michael to, to, to present your topic? Yes, you. absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, if you can just uh, maybe add the video, I can just show a face to a name. I can't actually change that function. Uh, Professor Chang, can you, can you add my video uh, just so people can see my face? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll get started uh, anyways in the meantime. Um, but uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, concurrent session. I, I want to thank, firstly, the ICRTH and the organizing committee for the conference all the supporting organizations. And I'd like to thank also um, Man Lai and uh, Professor Chang for uh, your great presentation. Alex, I'm looking forward to hearing all about Park Bus. Um, and interestingly, I have a little bit of a relationship between uh, uh, having spent some time in Taiwan, also being a Canadian myself, but uh, my name is Michael McCreesh. I will share my uh, desktop now and that, should be online right now. You can see it now, can you? I can't show my video, but I don't know. Oh, there we go. I got it. My apologies. Um, uh, what I do want to talk a little bit about is um, how bicycle tourism is going to play a role or can play a role for your community uh, in a post-COVID environment. Uh, my background uh, and introduction into bicycle tourism started uh, probably about eight years ago. I uh, was a project manager for a nonprofit organization that developed bicycle tourism in the province of Ontario. It became one of the leading organizations developing bicycle tourism and uh, I was mandated with um, developing product, managing a bicycle friendly business program and another different, uh, a number of different tasks, all that fell under the, the title of project manager. So with no further ado, I'm going to talk about how we can build back our vibrant communities with a bicycle. Um, firstly, I just want to talk about what bicycle tourism is, uh, and it's a quite a, a simple uh, definition. It's any travel related activity for the purpose of pleasure, which incorporates a bicycle. And uh, that definition has been adopted by the Adventure Cycling Association of the United States, uh, one of the leading uh, national organizations for the development of bicycle tourism in the US. They're also sort of seen as a, a leader in uh, product development, marketing, and cycling advocacy. So uh, generally what we can, uh, uh, how we can introduce uh, bicycle tourism is under these kind of key concepts. And one is destination riding. And this is uh, overnight cycling trips in a specific destination for, uh, a, and targeting the, the specific cycling amenities in that area. Uh, another uh, concept of cycle tourism is touring. This is fully independent travel that is self-sufficient on a bicycle. So this is where you'll see people carrying the luggage and gear on their bicycles, or they'll have a support vehicle, but they're traveling from destination to destination uh, without a, uh, a sort of facilitated tour experience, which leads to the next uh, concept of cycle tourism, which is events and tours. And this is visitation to a specific region uh, for the pur purpose of participating in an event or uh, participating in a guided or semi-guided tour at, uh, with a tour operator. And then finally, there's the idea of bicycle tourism, which is day rides in a destination or some of the uh, great cycling that we have in, 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 in cities around the world. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of developing bicycle tourism. I'm gonna to touch on the uh, economic and tourism impacts. I'll also talk about how bicycle tourism can play a role in rural economic development, as well as moving uh, people outside of these major uh, hubs for uh, arrival hubs in our tourism destinations, getting that money spent in some of the uh, regional areas. I wanna talk about how bicycle tourism can play a role in storytelling and branding for your destination and, and kind of present uh, a, a new engaging uh, destination image for communities. Um, and, and then also I wanna talk about uh, stewardship and community pride and how bis uh, bicycle tourism and cycling tends to invigorate local communities as well as those bicycle tourists who are visiting different areas on a bike or with a bike. 
So well, with regards to some of the economic and tourism impacts, I'm, I'm going to touch on some numbers a little bit later on, but for the most part, I'm just going to keep it kind of high level. Um, and I have my contact information at the end of the presentation. If you want me, uh, I can share with you a number of different resources I have uh, available, or I can ask, uh, answer some specific questions. But bicycle tourists uh, are not just uh, cyclists. They're also food tourists. They're also cultural tourists, and they're looking for a variety of different um, experiences that they can have on their holiday. And this is important for destination planners as well as uh, tour operators to understand that what a cyclist experiences off the bike is just as important as the cycling infrastructure and the experience on the bike. So there's a great opportunity for businesses to collaborate together to develop new tourism products. They're also high yield and repeat visitors. So when a cyclist has a great experience in a de destination, they will either return themselves or return with friends, which is another great aspect for tourism development in our, in our regions. Uh, they also stay longer uh, than the average non-cycle tourist. And I'll talk about some examples in just a little bit. Um, typically, the majority of bicycle tourists are independent travelers. They're also, if they do participate in uh, guided cycling experiences, these, uh, uh, pr these tour operators are typically smaller local providers. Um, with regards to the rural economic development and regional dispersal concept, bicycle tourism really creates uh, more geographic equity when it comes to tourism receipts. And in addition to this spread of wealth across a region, it also um, allows opportunities to mitigate against over-tourism and over-visitation in some of the popular destinations. So we can, as destination planners and strategic uh, and economic developers, start to uh, put plans in place to pull people out of these major uh, tourist destinations and into our rural areas to allow economic impact into some of our smaller communities. Uh, what it can also do is it can improve the quality of life for local residents by increasing the recreational opportunities that are available for local residents. And this in turn attracts new residents. So this is a key pillar for economic development um, is improving the quality of life and trying to uh, uh, generate new residential uh, participants in our communities. There's a tendency for cycle tourists to spend to, to like the local and uh, they do tend to spend money in local businesses. Um, this is uh, proven in a whole bunch of different research around the globe and from this we can create local jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities and new business development uh, in our rural, uh, rural communities. And this too is also a pillar of economic development in terms of investment attraction and uh, new business development. When it comes to uh, placemaking and branding uh, for, cycle, uh, for, cycle tourists, uh, for cycling and destinations, uh, I'm always an advocate of trying to integrate and incorporate a destination's image into cycling and cycling into a destination's image. And part of this is because um, what slow travel, which what is what bicycle tourism is, um, it supports the storytelling because cyclists are moving slower, uh, cycle tourists are moving slower through your community. They're looking at the nooks, the crannies, they're looking into the shadows, they're experiencing the smells and the sounds that a destination offers. And this is where if we are um, strategic in the, in the development of our uh, cycling product, um, we, we can uh, position our brand identity, our destination image into the cycling um, product and experience itself. And what we found uh, in Ontario, as well as in other jurisdictions, um, is that these routes, these uh, signature cycling routes in our destination become demand generators in and of themselves. And so from a placemaking perspective, um, uh, an international visitor who is looking for kind of bucket list cycling experiences, um, they'll gravitate towards a route before they'll gravitate and recognize sort of the, the region or the destination. So they want to go and experience a specific route um, first, then they'll look at what the destination uh, is from a visitor experience perspective. Also, what we see from both the businesses, but also the cyclists who participate in, cy uh, in, in cycle tourism experiences is that cycling uh, tends to uh, generate support for cycling advocacy in terms of cycling safety programs, cycling ed uh, education, and uh, advocacy for the maintenance and expansion of cycling infrastructure. We also, uh, in our experience in Ontario, uh, witness a lot of people uh, who would want to give back to the cycling community and support initiatives like cycling events and festivals 
and uh, different types of uh, cycling programs through volunteerism. It also uh, gets people engaged in stewardship, both from an environmental perspective. So people want to support green areas and green spaces for, for more cycling, but also for the maintenance and funding for different trail initiatives. Um, this also takes place from, as I mentioned, the local businesses who are catering to cyclists. They start seeing the economic and, and tourism impact that cycling is having on their community and on their local business. And they want to give back to support new trail development and maintenance and improving and extending some of these, these cycling programs. And so this is sort of a full circle way to, to start to uh, get both the businesses, the local residents, and the tourists on board to support environmental stewardship in your community. And uh, in, in general, cycle tourism pre-COVID was, uh, was booming on a regional, on a community, a regional and a national level. And this is just a quick snapshot of a handful of dozens of programs where um, uh, cycle tourism was being identified as a, as a pri uh, uh, pri and prioritized as a tourism product opportunity, both from cycling associations like Adventure Cycling, but also from tourism destinations like New Zealand uh, and uh, Oregon Tourism. In addition to this, and what, what came out of the uh, development of cycling infrastructure was the recognition that cyclists have a set of needs and uh, desires when traveling with a bicycle. And so what has come uh, as sort of a, a, a follow-up from the actual cycling infrastructure development is bicycle-friendly business programs. And what was originally kind of launched, I guess, would be in uh, Germany with the Betten Bike Program. Uh, we saw programs across North America and across Europe supporting bicycle tourists. And I would suggest if you're a destination planner or you're a tourism business, you can go on to any of these websites. I would suggest taking a look at the criteria that they have for catering to cyclists as a, as a visiting market and start to incorporate some of these things into your business or into your destination. And, and I, I think the community in, in, lar uh, in general is uh, open to, you know, replicating some of these uh, um, uh, programs in other jurisdictions. We also call that R and D, which is rip and duplicate. So I wouldn't uh, shy away from that in any regard. But bicycle tourism is big business in Europe, and it's been estimated that about $44 billion has been spent in 2016 in the EU region. That was linked to about half a million jobs in the EU, and that uh, together combined is more than the steel and cruise industry uh, itself. So bicycle tourism is having a major impact on, regional, on a, on a, on a uh, major regional level. It's not just in, in the uh, EU, but it's also happening in the US. The Outdoor Industry Association publishes this document called the Outdoor Recreation Economy. Uh, usually every three or four years in 2017, they found through their research that uh, bicycle tourism and related activities contribute $83 billion to the economy and supported uh, nearly 850,000 jobs in the US. Those numbers are kind of really big to get our head wrapped around and so we can look at it on a smaller regional level, which is a little bit easier to kind of chew uh, the state of Oregon um, is considered by many a leading uh, 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 destination in the development from a product and marketing perspective in bicycle tourism. They were seeing uh, significant uh, uh, contributions from bicycle tourists into their economy. Other points I'd just really like to highlight is the fact that uh, here in the third point is that uh, bicycle tourists in, on this study in 2012 were spending 20% more than the average cyclist. Um, and we see that number uh, replicated in a lot of different studies. Alex, this is, I believe, where you're located out on the uh, west coast of Canada. The Sea to Sky region is a region that only uh, ex extends from North Vancouver, Squamish into Whistler, just north of Vancouver, and it's only about 120 kilometers in length. It's a very mountainous region, the coastal mountains in British Columbia, and this contributes to uh, $10 million of non-resident spending to the host community. So it's a major, major economic driver for these regions. And the spin-off is signif significant when it comes to restaurants and bars and, and breweries and accommodation and stuff like that. But then the, the uh, COVID, uh, COVID hit, everyone was asked to stay inside. Um, we were all kind of closed up. And, and I know that uh, uh, this is currently the case in Taiwan, if I'm not uh, mistaken. People were also a little bit scared to take public transit for a number of reasons. 
And so people uh, across, not just in the, in the UK, but also in Europe and in North America, people were generally gravitating back to the bicycle. And uh, people were looking at ways to stay fit, stay active, and uh, stay distant. And this was proven in, in online data where we saw uh, significant growth from February to June 2020 um, across Europe, but also in places like North America and in Taiwan as well, where we saw increasingly uh, people were looking for ways they can travel around a destination uh, by bike. EcoCounter, which is a global manufacturer of bike counters, um, uh, published some data regarding the percentage change um, in people actually on the road. And you can see here that more and more people were on the bike. Um, so people are searching for it and people are riding on their bicycle. So why I think bicycle tourism is, a, is, a, is going to be an effective post-COVID strategy, I'm keeping an eye on the time, I've got a couple minutes left, but I believe cycling can be a good solution for the environment. Um, we see from a destination perspective, it reduces noise pollution, it reduces carbon emissions, and there's a lower uh, footprint for carbon footprint for your visitors while they may use a carbon uh, mode of transportation to get to your destination. When they're in your destination, they're gonna be reducing the carbon emissions. They also, as I talked about before, become stewards for trail and bicycle inf infrastructure, both in your destination, but also when they return home. And they have a low impact on the infrastructure while they're in their destination. So rather than people driving around and, and mucking up some of the, the, the roadways, these people are having a low impact on our infrastructure. COVID-19 was, of course, not only a economic and tourism uh, crisis, but also a public health crisis. And when we talk about wanting to rebound and recover out of tourism, we can look at cycling as a way to remain active for our visitors, for our local residents as well. It also replaces some of that sanitary sitting time on our travel. And this is a way that what we found uh, anecdotally is that people are very attracted to the idea of being active when they're on their holidays. And it improves physical well-being and the mental health of the participants, both local residents and visiting uh, and visitors. And as we see a, uh, the baby boomers are starting to age, they're looking for more active holidays. Cycling is a way that they can have this active holiday and have a low impact on their body. So it ticks that box as well. This is an example of what they call in Canada, hard water cy cycling, which is just cycling on frozen lakes. What we find from cycling is that it really starts to diversify your product, particularly if your destination is not currently developing cycle product uh, in and around your community. It improves the destination appeal. People recognize it as a very attractive destination uh, feature and they, and they kind of gravitate to, to these destinations. I know I've gone over 15 minutes. I'm just gonna be doing two, a couple more slides and then I'll, I'll wrap up and I'll leave a few other slides for the guests and for those online. Uh, cyclists don't wanna stay in uh, with a lot of people. They like to ride in quiet areas and during quiet times. So this is supportive of rural economic, uh, uh, rural tourism as well as travel during shoulder seasons and non-peak periods. Um, and they're, they're, they're active uh, cyclists and they're active uh, holiday makers. And, uh, in addition, I talked about some of these, the cycling as a solution for economic, rural economic development, improves the quality of life of your local residents. It can support local businesses and real estate values along uh, cycling infrastructure is proven to uh, um, increase um, if you develop bicycle infrastructure in your destination. Really quite quickly, I do apologize it. Uh, Alex, I know we're gonna be pinching you for times. I apologize. So as we, uh, more people are getting on the bike, what can we do as a destination? We need to leverage the growing interest in cycling and turn this habit and this interest into a passion and then into a commodified experience for our destinations. And this is the last slide I'm gonna uh, really talk about, but what we need to do for, from a cycle tourism development and destination development uh, perspective, um, we do need to uh, look at uh, our, the readiness of our experiences for bicycle tours and destination. This includes infrastructure, services, information and marketing aspects, transportation, how people are coming in and out of your community with a bicycle. We look at all of these aspects and through this, we were able to, you know, we, we are able to engage and encourage stakeholders to participate. We're pulling people in who are typically not part of a bicycle tourism sector or they don't recognize themselves as part of the bicycle tourism product. And so we can start to bring in, encourage and engage these individuals uh, through the development process. Once we have all these peak players involved, we have an understanding of what our bicycle tourism readiness is, then we can start putting, uh, in, you know, evaluating what our existing product is. We can look at the opportunities and gaps and we can put a strategy in place. 
uh, to develop bicycle tourism. It is always important, of course, to put a strategy behind a product and a program. This is the way that you're going to be able to encourage your partners to be able to, gen or to generate buy-in from your partners uh, over the long term um, because it doesn't happen directly overnight. And that's where I'm going to leave it. I have a few slides that have talk about some of the ideas and I'll leave these up here and I will make sure that everybody gets these slides because I've got some just tactical ideas on how you can develop bicycle tourism in your destination. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can send me an email. I would be glad to talk to you and provide you with these slides and other resources on the development of bicycle tourism in your destination. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for going over time. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, may I invite uh, Alex to present your topic? Yeah. I think uh, Michael has already answered uh, the questions from us by uh, the guests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So may I invite Alex? Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. That was a great presentation. Um, and no worries, I think my presentation is a little bit shorter, so it's all good. Uh, just going to share my screen here. Okay. Can you all see this? Yes, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so uh, my name is Alex Berliand. I'm one of the co-founders of an initiative called ParkBus. And um, I'll kind of go over the context um, of uh, sort of what came out, uh, how ParkBus was born, uh, to give you kind of the broader context of some of the issues that we realized um, when coming up with this concept. Uh, then I'll talk about the Kind of opportunity we saw. Um, I'll obviously introduce ParkBus and what we do and what we've done over the last decade and uh, talk about the goals, the benefits, what we're aiming to achieve with this initiative. And um, of course, from that, we'll kind of transition into what COVID did for us and, uh, um, you know, both the impact, but the opportunities coming out of it and moving forward. So a little bit about the context, the broader context. So I put down five main kind of issues that um, we were all kind of realizing, and this is related to park bus, but it's also related to kind of um, tourism on a broader scale. So of course, global climate change um, is something we're all quite familiar with at this point. Um, fragile environments um, is something that uh, specifically in the context of uh, parks and outdoor recreation, you know, many of these places that we uh, love visiting are experiencing more and more people going to these places and uh, it's, it's finding this balance between recreation and preservation of these spaces that we love. And uh, the third thing here is an authentic experience. So again, this is something that um, can be a pretty tricky thing. Um, people wanting to come to this, to a place like you see in this image, uh, expecting no one there and having kind of solitude and, and beauty in nature, but in reality, arriving there and seeing um, lines of people um, and, uh, and garbage and issues like that. Um, another thing that we have realized over the course of the last decade is that there's a pretty significant inequity when it comes to outdoor recreation and tourism. Uh, in terms of what people you typically end up seeing um, and who are the underrepresented segments of the population that you don't see. Um, and finally, social isolation is another really important aspect that uh, um, many people that we hear from and have heard over the years is something that um, has become more and more of an issue where you live in a large city and you don't actually have a network of people that are interested in the same um, the same kind of activities and hobbies and spending time outside like like you do. So out of all that, we recognized uh, an opportunity. The opportunity was uh, essentially uh, at the time we looked at Toronto as our main and, and first transportation hub, and we realized that there's just uh, no way to access many of these destinations and parks that Canada is uh, so well known for. 
So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create that connection uh, and make it make people um, access nature in a more sustainable way. So um, a little bit about what the innovation is. Uh, I know there's a lot of text on, on here. I'll just kind of break it down. Um, so what Parkbus is, um, it started in 2010 as a nonprofit initiative um, with that goal in mind of connecting at the time only one provincial park um, about three hours north of Toronto um, so that people could hop on a bus and spend a day or a weekend camping at this park. Um, over the course of the last decade, Park West really grew and became basically the world's first dedicated city to park transit service um, that allowed both domestic travelers and international travelers to um, experience and visit these parks. Um, the service works as basically a scheduled transportation service does. So we have a schedule that usually runs primarily in the summer months, but also a little bit in the shoulder season. And uh, people just kind of go on our website, they see what dates are available, they book the seats that they want, and we drop them off directly at campgrounds, uh, trailheads, canoe access points, and, and basically um, many different options that, that kind of cater to a different type of visitor. So if you're a backpacker, uh, we might drop you off at a trailhead, but if you just want to kind of stay at a cabin for the weekend, there are also options for that. So just to give you kind of a context, um, pre-COVID in 2019, Parkbus connected about 50,000 people throughout uh, our kind of operational season to about 50 parks across Canada. So as I said earlier, we started with just Toronto, but um, very quickly over the course of the last decade, we expanded to five different cities across Canada. and. Um, it also actually inspired park bus pilots outside of Canada as well, in Mexico and in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, Michael can speak to that at some point. Um, so, of course, also park bus, we realized is addressing a number of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I, put, I put them here. Um, some of them are pretty self-explanatory in terms of, uh, you know, making people um, more aware of their, their health and well-being in terms of spending time outside, um, creating connections and partnerships with different organizations that would normally in the tourism kind of uh, space would not actually communicate with one another. Um, climate change, um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things in the next few slides. This is just to give you a little screenshot of what our uh, website looks like when you're making a reservation. Um, it's just one little kind of snapshot, but to give you a rough idea, um, if Algonquin Provincial Park, which is uh, what you're seeing on this page, is the destination that you're looking to visit, then you simply have the selection of all these different dates. Um, on the same web page, we provide information about the park, um, general um, um, FAQs, so that people are coming prepared, messaging from the park, um, and other partners that is relevant. And all of this is kind of a streamlined digital process where at the end of it, um, whoever is making the reservation just receives an email with their ticket. So some of the things that Park Bus aims to achieve, um, sorry. Um, of course, uh, one of the basic ones is increased accessibility to parks and outdoor destinations in Canada and around the world. Um, pretty self-explanatory. We are the first ones that made that connection, as I said earlier, from city to park. We, by doing so, also want to encourage and facilitate first-time visits to parks. Um, as I said also earlier, especially among people that typically would not have the privilege or, or the opportunity to um, access these places. Um, in doing so, we also are reducing the traffic congestion in these parks. Um, and we're providing a more environmentally friendly alternative to, um, to using your car or renting a car. And uh, by doing so, we're bringing economic benefits to the local areas that are outside of these city centers, so often um, rural areas. And um, 
one of the things that also targets the social isolation that I talked about earlier is, is building community throughout the outdoors and through all these different activities like hiking, camping together, um, and making friends that way. So improved access, um, like I said, it's the first and only express bus service to parks. Um, so essentially up until that point, if you wanted to access um, a park like Algonquin or, or many of the parks that we go to, you had to basically rely on friends, on family, you had to rely on a car rental. Um, and this wasn't really an option for many people. Um, we make it pretty convenient. So as I said earlier, we drop people off directly at where they're looking to spend their weekend or their day. Um, and we provide opportunities for both overnight stays and day visits. So um, initially when we just were getting started, um, the idea was we were kind of thinking of it as a service that would be um, more applicable to people who are looking to do something more in the remote kind of wilderness back country. Um, and soon realize that there are lots of people that actually don't have that expertise and knowledge. So um, we started offering day trips as well. In some cases, um, some of our partners, the park agencies that we work with, we have also been able to create kind of a more uh, streamlined process where you get your park admission together with your park bus ticket, which makes it a lot easier for people. We are also striving and thinking all the time about how to make the outdoors more accessible to a wider range um, of the population. And again, in Toronto, for example, just to give you an idea, it's, it's roughly uh, a quarter of the population simply does not have access to a vehicle. Um, so this became very quickly a very affordable alternative to car ownership. Um, and actually, even people that um, had a vehicle Families, for example, um, often commented that they would way rather just leave the car behind and, um, and take park bus. Um, we also started in the last uh, few years uh, a program that is specifically targeting newcomers and immigrants. Um, and in this slide, you can see the background image here actually is from a trip that we uh, fully subsidized the transportation costs for a group of Syrian refugees um, a few years ago that uh, recently arrived to Canada. And actually it was a, a pretty special um, opportunity. Many of uh, them, actually all of them pretty much had never seen snow uh, before. So it was a pretty special day to experience together. And um, it really makes a big difference um, for people to know that they can actually access these places and spend some time outdoors. So what NatureLink is all about um, is basically partnering directly with settlement agencies, um, environmental organizations, and different charities that work with vulnerable populations. And through funding and support from various partners of ours um, across Canada, including some park agencies that support the program financially, we're, we're actually able to fully subsidize the cost of the transportation. Um, so this is a program that continues to grow and uh, we're pretty excited by it. We're hoping that it will um, keep growing in the coming years as we come out of, of COVID. And there's a quote here that really stuck with us um, from a few years ago when someone told us that basically before park bus, before using this opportunity, the the word camping was for them just in the dictionary so they never really imagined themselves in that kind of setting so naturally as you can imagine using um, uh, a vehicle like a bus uh, would reduce traffic congestion to many of the parks that we go to some of these places suffer from this issue quite significantly um, i am located on the west coast of canada as michael said in the sea to sky corridor just north of Vancouver. One of the most popular parks uh, in this region is called Joffrey Lakes. Um, as you see, it's beautiful lakes with alpine kind of scenery and it, it's really stunning. Um, but also because of the ease of accessibility to some of these places, um, the, the parking lot for this park, for example, tends to look 
um, completely full like this and it starts happening really, really early in the morning. And so over the years, also with the rise of social media, um, these are issues that are just on the rise essentially. And um, what we are trying to do is to encourage people to leave the car behind and uh, make places like that uh, look more like a park rather than a parking lot. You can also probably um, uh, imagine that uh, using a, a bus as opposed to a, a vehicle would reduce carbon emissions pretty significantly. Um, I always love showing this image just to illustrate just you know how many people can essentially fit on one bus as opposed to all these vehicles that you see over here. Um, so again, we are always trying to position ourselves and look ahead and be part of the solution moving forward so that um, so that we are actually a, a kind of a green eco-friendly alternative to car use. Um, in terms of economic benefits, uh, you know, like I said earlier, people that would normally arrive to a city center like Toronto, there's a lot of tourist attractions um, and people end up spending a lot of money in these large city centers. So by, by taking uh, many of these people outside of the city to places like these parks, to these different accommodation providers, connecting them to outfitters, um, dropping them off at uh, restaurants and offering guided trips. Um, these are all opportunities for people to spend more money at these uh, more rural areas. And um, it also brings a lot of new opportunities for us to partner with different um, outfitters, like I said, and uh, create packages for people so that they can have uh, more of an all-inclusive experience. One of the other things we focus on, which I touched on earlier regarding social isolation, is building community in the outdoors. So naturally, this, this tends to happen even on self-guided trips where people just buy the transportation component alone. They get on a bus, and usually at the end of the day, there's kind of a sense of uh, camaraderie on the bus where people uh, share stories. They often bump into each other on the trail. So it's a really great opportunity to kind of make connections and, and feel safe also in the outdoors. Um, we, this kind of prompted us to start a new program under Park Bus that is called Active Days. And I'll just share a couple of images here. Oops. So um, I think maybe I'm running out of time here, but um, Active Days is uh, this program that is especially focused on community building outdoors. It's uh, grown significantly over the last few years and we have uh, uh, about 40 or 50% of these participants actually have access to a vehicle, but they're choosing to come on these trips because of the community, because they feel safe, because they feel like they have the knowledge of a guide with them. So COVID hit, uh, we know uh, how that went for everybody. So for us, of course, parks closed. Um, Social distancing and uh, seating restrictions basically meant for us that we're uh, kind of hitting a dead end, so to speak. Um, and it's kind of, we're basically, we've been on pause for quite some time. Now that parks are starting to reopen and there's more vaccinations and loosening restrictions, um, we're also recognizing the opportunity and the potential of what's coming ahead. So um, there's kind of a recognition that's time spent outdoors is very valuable and is very good for our mental health. So I'll kind of quickly, if, if I have maybe a couple more minutes, I'll just run through uh, what are some of these opportunities. So what we want to make sure is that moving ahead um, past COVID, we actually have pretty significant opportunities because of this popularity in outdoor recreation. So what we feel we have a role and a responsibility is to basically better educate people. Uh, so not just bring people, drop them off at a destination, but uh, be a part of their journey of learning. Um, so some of the things that of course will naturally be happening in the next little while is some of the bus companies we're working with, uh, we have these additional safety measures and protocols in place that allow us, will allow us to run this coming summer. 
we are also spending a lot more time thinking about how we educate our passengers. So working with park agencies directly um, to make sure that people know what leave no trace means, uh, how to have a plan when they're coming to a park, especially if it's more remote in the wilderness. And all of this with the mindset that instead of bringing tourists, what we're actually trying to make these tourists into are environmental stewards. Um, of course, it also brings with it new collaborations and opportunities for us to work with uh, new markets and new um, partners or actually expand on partnerships that we've already had. So, for example, bringing people to events like outdoor races and other outdoor opportunities and venues. Um, and finally, it also is making us kind of rethink where we bring people to begin with. So as I said earlier, we, we typically have focused on the places that are already popular. So with COVID here and with realizing the over-tourism issue that is on the rise, uh, this is kind of a time for us to think more critically and, and how can we leverage the knowledge that we have and the opportunity we have working with the parks so that we actually can create experiences like the one you see in this image where it's, it's actually you alone on a lake and it's not crowded with a lot of people or garbage around you. Um, okay, I think I kind of went a little quick there at the end, but uh, I'll open it to questions here. And again, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share our story with ParkQuest. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation uh, delivered by Professor Zhao, Michael, and Alex. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you will, uh, have enjoyed this uh, this session. And thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.